morning everyone this is uh, neeton and today the topic of this uh, guest lecture is in these times perhaps uh, one of the most interesting and very topical issues uh, the issue of uh, change the issue of uh, managing during times of constant incessant change that we are in right now right uh, so uh, the guest lecture today will be about uh, two aspects you know one is or three aspects largely first you know i'll set a bit of a context of uh, the state we are in uh, then i'll share some of my experiential learnings uh, through my various years uh, in large enterprises around uh, what works when, when it comes to transformative change and then we will go and uh, interview uh, some of the change practitioners and see what uh, you know uh, pearls of wisdom they have to share with us again on based on experience uh, on the topic of change management so let's start off with some context setting again right so uh, i mean very clearly uh, you know we are in a in an era which is perhaps best characterized or best stated as the digital era right as you can see through the years you know there was the farming era or the agriculture era then we had the industrial era and you know some might say the last decade or so was perhaps the information era uh, but now we are firmly ensconced Uh, in the digital era and this digital era uh, presents a certain set of characteristics only a few of which i'm going to cover in relation to the topic of change management yeah i mean first and foremost uh, the customers you know our customers the general public consumers uh, businesses right society at large is uh, driving a certain set of uh, changes on us right so you know one of the big changes inherent changes in customer behavior is you know earlier products would do you know you would go buy a product right Uh, a phone for example but but now increasingly uh, just you know offering a product is not good enough you need to offer services right so uh, you know some services around your on your on your digital products like laptops or 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 phones you know you make sure you provide maintenance you provide service right but then th- that doesn't the customer expectations don't stop there right the next level is they are looking for experiences right so you know when you app, enter an apple shop or when you enter somewhere new right so something you feel it right that that the experience here the customer focus in fact uh, a lot of the retail shops now the brick and mortar are converting from selling to selling experiences right so that is because the customers are demanding it that's a change that has happened in the customer expectations and i believe in the next few years you will see that uh, you know the large expectation change that will happen in in the customer domain is that of wanting trust right demanding trust right building that trust level with your uh, with your customers so that uh, you are engaged at a much more deeper emotional level right so you know the one change in the digital era is this progress of customer expectations the second one is you know based on largely driven by technology i would believe that there is just this huge explosion of business models right from you know as i said selling experiences for example disney uh, in the pro uh, you know pre covid times and i'm sure Uh, that's exactly what they do in the post covid times right user generated content you know youtube for example ability to monetize you know like uh, you know monetize your own content yeah quite similar to the mooc that i'm doing today although it's not for monetization purposes but ability to share your content over these platforms right like so i mean there's so many right mass customization look at nike look at adidas you can today customize your shoes uh, and do your own designs on 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 specific uh, Uh, brands that uh, both of these uh, you know big uh, shoe manufacturers have created for for the purpose of mass customization i mean the mox oxymoron itself right mass customization but in the digital era uh, you know definitely possible right uh, then as a service you know uh, you would have seen um, i mean multiple business models you know i remember uh, you know uh, the dollar club right it was called i think the the somebody launched this uh, around uh, shaving products right for a dollar yeah and there's a wonderful ad on youtube by the ceo i think this was acquired by gillette if i'm not mistaken right or one of these big big companies uh, yeah but you know converting something which is so classically a product into into a service right so available at a subscription right uh, similarly i mean e-commerce peer to peer peer to peer commerce right uh, also largely now nowadays driven by distributed ledgers yeah ability to barter pretty much like barter bartering system yeah and then you know things like the freemium business model right which is you know offering uh, a basic service like linkedin the basic service is free but if you want a premium services then you pay for it right so uh, getting people into the network 
uh, enticing them through uh, a, a free product and once the network effect starts going on then you know kind of uh, charging them for the premium services right similarly i mean data as a service and then the mother of all inventions i think in the digital era which is the uh, you know which is the whole concept of platforms right uh, platforms which are underpinned by very low uh, you know uh, capex very asset light highly agile underpinned by network effects underpinned by building large ecosystems which they, uh, they operate right so amazon even microsoft alibaba some of the huge platforms that uh, are so uh, you know kind of so prevalent in the digital era right so that's another aspect of the digital era and then of course you know tech tech, tech technology has made an impact i mean incessant innovation in technology you know be it uh, be it be bitcoin uh, be, 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 be distributed ledgers right which uh, ha hasn't really taken off uh, but you know uh, i think what has happened there is largely uh, what started off as a consumer uh, you know unrestricted uh, kind of uh, very idealistic approach to a distributed ledger is now probably much more anchored on what these business networks right whether it be supply chain related whether it be food related right whether it be credit related so there are a lot of these closed business networks where one central uh, entity kind of starts it off and then creates a business network around it right so yeah so so you know that plus you know i mean uh, you've seen uh, ai I, I think ai is now uh, you know the, the winters have long gone and it's ready for already already in our lives with respect to consumers but definitely ready for prime time uh, when it comes to enterprises right similarly you know when i studied my masters you know the house looked proper right of technology nowadays i mean there is such a revolution in technology so many different technologies and that also is a key underpinning characteristic of the digital era right and then of course you know i mean the topic of today you know i mean just a few weeks back you know when i was doing a, this lecture uh, in dubai in one of the classrooms right uh, i was going through this slide and saying okay look at it right in the digital era 2020 came along and you know and i was telling my kids it's going to be a brilliant year you all you know they are both going to college so you know it's going to be a great year for humanity right and look what happened right we've had trade wars uh, through 19 and continuing to into 20 uh, some of the uh, geopolitical tensions uh, you know uh, uh, have resulted in uh, i mean pretty much uh, you know uh, tensions in the, in certain regions uh, on, almost nearing war like situations right uh, uh, you know the apocalypse of retail as they say you know uh, business model after business model getting annihilated you know brands that we have lived with for so many years you know kind of filing for bankruptcy and then you know uh, this was one part of a slide which i said you know the potential for a pandemic and you know covid covid 19 right and look what has happened since then you know the whole world has gotten into deep freeze right and you know who could have in their in their wisdom ever predicted something like this right uh, you know i, I was uh, talking to someone and uh, you know they were referring to uh, to uh, uh, the wimbledon company which was perhaps the only one after sars which had done insurance on pandemic right and when the pandemic actually impact, impacted wimbledon they got a good payout but they paid for 10 years i mean they had the foresight to actually take insurance for pandemic but rest of the world societies us as hum human beings governments none of us were prepared for a big hit like this right so I mean, so, so the fact of this slide is that change is, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but the fact is change is the only constant, right? And, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19 has perhaps accentuated this sentence uh, like no other, right? I mean, yeah, the, the amount and the intensity of change is amazing. And what is going to come of it, you know, in the context of the post-COVID era, I mean, uh, how the companies deal with it, perhaps some of the experiences that I'm going to share with you are probably much more relevant, you know, as we, as economies, societies, us as individuals, companies, businesses come out, come out of this pandemic and into, into a new era, which is the post COVID era. Right? And then, you know, somebody coined this beautifully, right? Which is Nasim Nicholas Taleb, right? A, a whole a concept, a whole competency of anti-fragility, you know, it's a, it's an, uh, uh, you know, it's a it's a word that he invented, uh, but you know the whole idea that it, you know most people when change hits them they are fragile and they break. Yeah, uh, some people are robust, resilient. So when change hits them, they're able to take the shock, they go down and they bounce back right to the normal level. But I think 
what he coined is perhaps much more relevant for us as professionals, for businesses, uh, perhaps even for societies, especially in the post COVID era, right? Which is to make change a part of your life such that, you know, you actually thrive uh, in constant change, you know, become anti-fragile. So when a change hits you, uh, right, you are able to mutate, you are able to deal with the change and come out better than, you know, better than before, right? So this whole concept of not just being re re resilient to change, but being anti-fragile and being uh, being accepting and wanting change to come to you because you know that with constant change, you've developed the muscles to, in fact, improve your performance, to get better with change is perhaps a society uh, which is much more relevant in the uh, a paradigm of competency which is much more relevant in the post covid post covid era yeah uh, now of course you know uh, I, I as part of this looking at this lecture you know i said okay where what are the various theories of change management and there are so many right of course my what i'm going to describe to you are not anchored on any of these theories i mean whether it be theory u which i had myself studied in a in a mooc with professor otto or you know any of McKinsey seven model, the Sartre change model, right? So basically, either these theories describe you know the emotional journey or the kind of journey of uh, through this change in terms of the emotions, or describe you know uh, how to go about it, right? So there are these seem to be the two paradigms. You know what I'm going to describe a bit is not relating to any of these paradigms, but much more you know through my experience, what have been some of the mantras of change that uh, you know that have worked. Uh, you know that have worked for me right uh, now of course you know uh, I always say this that the mantras in context of a particular uh, aspect you know uh, uh, even the mantras are around a certain objective that you have right and uh, uh, you know the objective for me through uh, describing the change mantras is not being to just you know uh, do digital which is you know fine I mean a lot of companies do that you know uh, you know especially if you see right after you know, COVID happened, a lot of the digital acceleration happened in companies because we were forced to, right? But it's more, much more about being digital, you know, changing the soul of the organization, uh, you know, uh, changing the DNA of the organization, changing the genomes so that you are able to become anti-fragile, right? And being able to manage, uh, you know, this constant barrage of change and being also able to uh, truly become nimble, right? Being able to become totally digitized and having a culture of openness and transparency, radical transparency, which a lot of the digital natives are uh, uh, so well known for, right? So, so I think uh, the context of the mantras are about authentic, uh, authentic, uh, you know, digital, uh, which is much more being digital than, than doing digital. And, uh, you know, something that I, I espouse an approach to that has been, you know, uh, uh, much more a granular honeycomb based approach where you take a cell, uh, you know, work on it, transform it, link it to a set of digital capabilities, take another cell, transform it, link it to a set of digital capabilities, and hopefully you will get a bit of an exponential curve in your large enterprises, right? So, so in context of the objective of being digital, in context of, you know, doing the change transformation programs of, uh, of digital transformation, uh, you know, uh, a bit more organically, one cell at a time, is what I describe, you know, the next segment, which are the which are the change month. So in the context of large scale transformation and largely for me, the context has been within large enterprises, right? What are some of the things that work in terms of change? Uh, you know, what are some of the mantras for change, right? So let's get into that. Right? So, you know, the first experience I've had is that a, a change needs a burning platform, right? And uh, what I mean by that is, it is very difficult for a large enterprise to accept transformative change without building the case, you know, based on, on a burning platform, right? So I often say, right, even if you don't have one at that time, you know, create one, right? And I think uh, my experience in one particular uh, change, uh, fairly, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of a root level uh, change that I was part of uh, was, you know, that uh, from a business perspective, uh, there was not much of a burning platform. You know, we were doing pretty well. Uh, you know, the revenues were doing fine. You know, costs were under largely under control. So the business was doing well. Yeah. So in that case, that was a technology change. Uh, we created a change based on a potential 
future uh, uh, issue, right? So on a on a burning platform based on how the status quo status quo will lead to uh, you know a, a, a lot of issues, uh, you know when we just extrapolate the current situation into the future, right? So that was uh, you know so that was one experience that I had. Uh, then in 2013, when I was uh, designing the uh, digital transformation in a in a leading uh, you know airline company. Uh, so there, the burning platform was much more based on uh, on opportunity, right? So you know you could have a burning platform based on uh, uh, you know some issues uh, which are right now issues which might occur in the future with extending and extrapolating the status quo, or you might create a burning platform uh, based on uh, opportunities. Uh, for example, if you're looking at a digital transformation, right? Uh, but having said this, you know, I, I mean you don't need a burning platform because right now because COVID-19 has given every company every aspect of the economy a burning platform already right so I, I hence you know in the current context I feel that uh, it is perhaps the right point uh, to leverage this burning platform for sustainable authentic transformations uh, within enterprises and within also as professionals as you move forward right so first first thing you know Think of a burning platform, build one if you don't have it, but in the COVID, post-COVID era, you have it. It's given. It's been given by nature, right? So leverage it. Second is, you know, uh, you know, most transformation change results in organizational restructuring and people straight away shift into uh, boxes, organization structure, right? You know, the C-level expects it and the tendency is to shift, straight away shift there, right? And you know, my experience has been that the best way to manage this change is through that process, you know, which is uh, once you have the burning platform, what is the strategy that will help you move towards the opportunity or get rid of the issues that you, you've been, uh, you know, you've been highlighting as part of the burning platform. So develop your strategy, then look at the processes, then perhaps look at the structure and then finally at the people, right? So, uh, you know, a bit more strategy first and then people last is uh, you know the way to go in terms of managing the the change process itself right uh, because you know i mean uh, without having gone through this uh, you could end up having biases in the way uh, you restructure based on the executives who come and then you know there is not really a sustainability to to what you do right so so think think of the process you know strategy process structure people yeah. uh, now you know any change, uh, whether small or big, uh, you know, you will you will you, you will face uh, resistance. I mean, there is no doubt, right? And and typically, uh, most empirical evidence will tell you of the bell curve. You know, there will be a few who will support. There will be a middle, uh, big lot of people who will be in the middle. I mean, they are <laughs> on the fence, right? They they will see whether the guys who have stuck their neck out and have supported the change, how will that pan out for them? And then on the right extent, they will be these cynics, right? So I think it's crucially important that as you design your change, as change, uh, as change managers, as professionals of change, the first thing you do is build a very strong uh, internal coalition. You know, uh, I remember, uh, you know, a particular aspect of this was, uh, you know, uh, in, in an organizational model where everything was highly federated. Uh, we had I had designed a, 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 a review board, a portfolio review board, uh, which comprised 21 very senior executives from different fields, right? So they had their own respective, uh, uh, you know, operations, commercial, uh, you know, holidays. They had their own divisions to take care of, and quite contrary to the way the overall operating model of the company worked, I was asking them to get together and take decisions on managing the portfolio of technology investments, right? So this was a very difficult change to manage because it was not set for at a corporate level. It was, you know, kind of going upstream. And second was I was dealing with 21 different senior executives with different personalities, right? And I remember, you know, while we were designing it, we reached out to a few, which we used to call the good apples and got them on our side, got them passionate. And during the first such running of this event, uh, I remembered, you know, when one of the cynics pointed out saying, you know, why are all of us together in this meeting? Why are we wasting two days of our life? You know, you guys should just sort it out. We don't, don't need to be here. Uh, you know, some of the good apples then helped us manage that situation. 
and get it get everybody aligned to the original objective right so for me that is a example of how a strong internal coalition a strong internal uh, you know squad of people uh, you need to manage to get them on the side so that when you know these cynics come in and try and disrupt you have some support in your change program so remember that right you know uh, think of a burning platform think of a proper process to do it starting with strategy and purpose right and then make sure you build a strong internal uh, coalition and don't start the change program without having some good people and strong influencers on your side yeah then i think you know this was even before covid i think you know post covid as well pace is going to be your friend you know i mean you know gone are the days where you design change programs for 3 years right and 5 years yes it does take time i'm not saying that the you know i think miracles happen overnight changes take time right so it does take time to change especially the mindset of the people because that's where you need to get to right from above the iceberg to below the iceberg but split up that long journey into short pacey sprints right yeah and you know uh, if i remember you know the two big change programs we uh, i remember in my previous life and we've run like i've run at least three of those now which involved mass scale change right and it involved people change changes as well but for me it was important to set the pace so almost uh, on a as soon as i started the program after the internal coalition was done you know i set up a date 18th november right on sunday or monday 18th november is when we will do this right so set up a milestone make it speedy do, you will never get to perfection in the in such kind of a transformative change and pace is uh, is crucially important right and i think uh, when when you look post covid you know uh, i think pace will be a highly uh, important competitive advantage because more the more countries are the the more fast the countries and businesses move uh, into getting back to normalcy or becoming anti fragile and getting better the more will they build these competitive moats you know against other countries and against other businesses so pace in the post post covid era uh, is even more important uh, and in any case for change i think pace is a, is a, is a friend of yours so embrace it right you know and, and then you know of course you know the other other mantra for me has been uh, yes you need to build momentum around change uh, you need to make sure uh, everybody gets involved there is almost a movement as i said you know so i was involved with a uh, a big brand uh, change and we had consultants from from the netherlands and they spoke about you know building uh, building internal movements right so while you build an external brand you build internal movements around that brand which i fully understand right but but having said this uh, you know culture and change is also a highly leader centric topic right so it cannot be that you delegate this down uh, as much as you cannot delegate talent management down to uh, you know to 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 the troops right i think you need to uh, you, you need to get them involved but you need to be in charge you need to be the role model so leaders need to take charge be involved take those calls take those decisions be in the forefront be the role models that's crucially important for managing change right for if if there is any topic other than people and talent which perhaps needs direct leadership uh, intervention direct leadership involvement you know almost on the face i mean you know very visible leadership involvement it is it is change and the management of especially transformative change right being digital rather than just doing it then you know through the change program the one other aspect which is hugely useful yeah is and i think that's much more relevant to my previous comment about building this momentum right getting people aligned is the communicate 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 right uh, there is no dearth don't worry about it that you are overdoing it no amount of communication is ever overdone especially during a transformative change change program uh, you know through a Uh, a great friend of mine who was who was in munich uh, he had coined this term so it's not mine i don't uh, claim but i've used it in so many times in my different aspects in my career so he said you know uh, make communication like the vernissage uh, the vernissage is a is how the artists display their art right so we really embrace that concept and uh, you know uh, while the design used to go on every thursday the teams would come back and they would display their uh, you know uh, results Uh, of whatever design they were doing whatever change uh, they were doing either it was organizational change or relating to running a new product or in fact a complete uh, you know rehash of the organizational business model itself 
right? So whatever change program you're doing, the ability to at a frequent interval getting people involved. So not just sending off you know uh, emails, right? Uh, not just mass communication, but face to face where you display your work and get people to interact and give feedback. I think is a crucial part of uh, a change uh, change uh, uh, a change program and a change artists uh, you know uh, uh, you know toolkit. Uh, to, to be able to communicate and get the message across, right? So, so communicate, 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 right? Now, of course, you know, the other paradigm which has perhaps shifted and pro probably also very relevant to the post-COVID era is, uh, you, know, uh, we, we, you know, I mean, you cannot sit there, you know, uh, conceptualize, uh, you know, uh, what the world will look like for two years, then, you know, do a bit of feeling through, and then actually start getting some work done. I mean, those days are completely gone, right? And uh, you know, I used to run a uh, innovation summit in my previous company, and uh, you know, we used to get uh, these thought leaders from 16, 16, 17 thought leaders from across the world, uh, and they would intersect with some of us executives in a very close setting. You know, and in one of the innovation summit, uh, one of the thought leaders said this, right? Said, you know, initially do start with do, right? Get stuff done, do a trial then feel what's going on, then think how you can scale, right? So ability to do these rapid experiments, even though in a change program, in, in a pacey manner, right? In a fast paced manner is crucially important so that you are learning directly from experimentation then rather than the learning from theory, yeah? And in the post COVID era, I mean, this is probably get even more important because nobody really know how this will pan out. So you will have to do experiments, multiple experiments to actually see how the consumers react to it and then whatever experiments and based on the consumer reaction, you scale those. So in a change program, very relevant to do, feel and think the other way around, the other way, the, you know, the changing the status quo in the post COVID era, perhaps even more, much more important, right? Yeah. And then, you know, this is uh, uh, an interesting, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, concept. It's called this, I don't know how to pronounce it, but Serifin framework by, by Dan Snowden, right? But essentially, I mean, in, in, in a sense, what it says is there is a difference between, uh, you know, colloquially, you might use complexity and uh, complex and complicated in the similar breadth, right? Uh, but uh, from a decision making perspective, these are quite different. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, if the cause and effect can only be perceived in hindsight, right? So it depends upon the relationship of cause and effect, right? Uh, yeah. So, for, for example, you know, uh, you know, the paradigm of decision making, yeah, uh, could be command and control. If you know exactly, if you attempt to do something, what will be the effect of, uh, you know, if, if if you do something, what will be the effect? If you are able to determine that, right? So, let, let me take an example, right? Uh, so, uh, a, a, a let's say a A three eighty or a Boeing triple uh, seven, right, has so many parts. It's quite complicated, right? Uh, so if you were to change one part or if a part was uh, getting impacted, you know, what should you do about it? You know, what if this was to happen, how to deal with it? Yeah, it's complicated, but you could you could actually map it out. Yeah, you could put down all the 50,000 parts. You could correlate each one and then you could bring up a model that says if you impact this, this is what's going to happen. Right. So complicated situations are complicated. They're tough to understand, but you can map them out and you can get to you know kind of sensing analysis and then respond right those kind of decision making paradigms right but i think what uh, is so relevant to post covid which i think it has already been relevant to the digital era is that we are actually moved away from the world of you know good practice best practice complicated environments you know to actually highly complex context contexts right so what i mean there is it's very difficult to being able to analyze and then respond right to be able to sense and what you need to do is actually as i was saying earlier to be able to probe right then sense and then respond this whole you know paradigm shift of decision making which is what humanity management leadership has been used to which is com command and control you know i know what to do right to being able to sense and respond is one huge big shift uh, from a change management program, uh, from a change management artist perspective or a manager's perspective, and also you know especially so so in the post COVID era. And as I was saying previously, 
you know, what you'll have to do is probe, you know, with a few experiments, sense the results, and then respond, right? So moving into that decision-making framework, perhaps based on the Sanofin framework, which I quite, in, quite like and is quite relevant, is uh, important, is an important aspect of, of managing change. Then, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, when I was doing this in another classroom, somebody asked me, right, so uh, to consult or not, you know, do you just offload this to consultancy, to consultancies and, you know, I have worked with large consultants all my life. I've been a large consultant. So there is no judgment path. There is no, uh, you know, what I'm going to say is, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for what they bring to the table. But I think, you know, like people management, I think change management is crucially a leadership topic, right? So you cannot just offload, uh, you can get help, but you cannot outsource your accountability to to a consultant also you know you probably want to lead the change as i said it's a leadership topic so get a consultant who will help with the process but let the content of uh, the change very be closely managed by yourself by your leadership uh, by your leadership team right so so uh, get help but don't outsource your accountability stay in charge of your change management program that is a crucial learning that i've i've myself seen through the process of managing large scale yeah? and then last but not the least you know it's uh, finally change management is about impacting cultures right because uh, you know above the pyramid are strategies processes structures even people right what is below the pyramid and which is what will be sustainable right if you want meaningful authentic change which lives well beyond your own uh, career or your own tenure with that change right uh, then what you need to do is you need to get to mindset you know uh, I, I, at, by no means am I saying that skill set is not important I think expertise specialism skill set is is quite important it's going to be even more important in the uh, in the post COVID era yeah uh, but I think what's even more crucially important is to change uh, you know change the mindset yeah and uh, as, as you know, I mean, being, being perpetually curious, wisdom and curiosity, right? Yeah, wisdom perhaps comes with experience, but curiosity is a mindset trait, right? Being curious all the time, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, while this might sound like a, a play of words, but uh, leaving this uh, cultural aspect that people are not just learning to know, right? Because these things are going to change. I mean, nobody knew about covid uh, 19. Nobody knew about pandemic, right? Nobody knew, really knew about what exponential curves mean. Nobody really knew what a sim symptom, sim you know, all these terms which have, which the pandemic has exposed us, you know, even those which I can't pronounce, <laughs> right? So we did not know this, right? I think, but knowing to learn, being curious, being inquisitive is what you want to leave behind, uh, you know, in, in the culture of the organization uh, as part of the change program, right? And I think, there it's crucially important you know i think culture is a derived variable you know apologies for sounding like a geek but uh, you cannot impact culture directly you can't go to people and say listen i want you to change from learning to know to learn please do it you know it's not going to happen right so you cannot impact organizational culture directly what you need to do as part of the change program is you know through doing right through sensing and responding you need to be able to create uh, these success stories, yeah, you need to be able to then celebrate and reward and recognize those uh, success stories. Then hopefully that pyramid of people, right, who are in the center, who are waiting, will shift towards the left, towards the people who are anyway converted, and you will see that mass movement building up within your organization. So think about, uh, you know, accomplishments, think about the mindset change and the culture change as part of your, as part of your uh, ch uh, change program because that perhaps is one of the most profound things uh, uh, of any change program and any change manager right so to summarize right after having seen the context that we live in which is a digital era and uh, some of its characteristics right and then from a from a perspective of transformational change right what are some of the mantras that what are some of the learnings uh, you know from my perspective just to summarize right i think uh, think of a burning platform, COVID-19 provides everyone, you know, through nature, a sitting burning platform, leverage it, right? Purpose and strategy first, don't jump straight away to people. Most people tend to do it. Those seems to be the easiest way forward, you know, let's just shift people. No, don't do it. Don't fall into that trap. Relook at your purpose, relook at your strategy, and then through a defined process, 
structure and then people right build an internal coalition don't start without it you know get a few good apples get them as passionate about your change as much as you are right keep the change time bound at pace in sprints pace is a big friend of yours during these trans especially during transformational change programs communicate 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 no amount of communicate communication is enough the more you spend on communication the more you get towards building internal movement towards towards the change right then remember quick wins go viral right so accomplishment accomplishments doing stuff you know uh, and celebrating them is is a critical mantra to success hire consultants get help but don't outsource your accountability leadership change and leadership and you know one mantra is kind of missing here which is it's a leadership topic right so make sure you are in charge you are visibly in charge you are the role model and don't just delegate responsibility to teams or to consultants yeah so not your typical consultant and remember the biggest part of change programs and the most difficult part is to shift the mindset right so spend time thinking about it nurturing that mindset remember it's a derived variable you can't impact it directly so work around it so that you are able to nurture uh, you know a garden where the new culture that you are espousing is able to build and grow and uh, and and you know and and grow yeah so last for me uh, in this section is then you know having shared my experiences i said you know okay let me go back to those uh, six seven literature topics you know given that uh, i'm going to be probably addressing a few students in this lecture so i found that perhaps you know what i have been thinking uh, you know some of the mantras that i have perhaps are much more you know uh, aligned to this quarter uh, model of uh, change you know where you create agency you build collision right so just just uh, retrospectively you know my learning seem to fit a bit more in this quarter model if uh, that is of interest to you right so so you know just this kind of you know finishes the first two segments uh, now what i'll do in the next segment is actually get some enterprise uh, network uh, colleagues of mine uh, to share with you some of their experiences around the change management topic and then i'll come back and summarize so thank you very much hi guys my name is patrick patrick neff uh, i am uh, from switzerland originally from zurich area and um, i was asked to give you a bit of a input some of the learnings that I made with respect to a transformational change initiative, what works and what not. Um, I've been in different roles during my professional life. Probably the most important, uh, the most impactful that I've been was uh, 12 years at Emirates Group in Dubai, where I was a SVP IT, how it was called, basically the CIO role. I joined Emirates in 2006, early 2006. Um, after already a few weeks in the company, I realized that I had to do a complete rebuild of the IT, a major change. That by just sort of tweaking a bit the org structure or changing a bit the processes, I would I would not be able to um, to achieve what we needed to achieve. Um, and on top of that, you had to imagine that that was right at the beginning of the big growth phase of Emirates. The company was supposed to grow double digit figures every year. So we had at, uh, at that time, you know, new new aircraft joining the fleet literally every week. We had uh, at some peak times a few years later, we had uh, a month where I think we had about five big aircrafts um, joining the fleet. This is for other airlines, the whole long haul fleet. So um, we had to focus on um, being able to support that growth. So we had to become scalable, predictable, um, and and stable in terms of operations. Now that's a traditional um, or a classical situation for a transformation. At that time, we didn't call it transformation; we called it change because uh, at that time the buzzword transformation was not so established. So it was a traditional classical change project. Now I've been in a lot of change projects um, in earlier positions in my life, and looking back, I have to say most of them did actually not really succeed. They didn't succeed mostly because the implementation of the change of the transformation was not consequently done because people at the grassroots did not buy into the changes. The typical pattern you know, of um, traditional hierarchical organized company is at the top, the managers, the bosses decide to do a change. 
they call in one of the large consulting groups, um, you know, McKinsey or Bain or BCG or whatever you want to pick. They arrive with a school bus full of juniors. They train on your projects. They run through your organization, talk to a lot of people, waste their time, suck up all the good ideas, then pour it into nice PowerPoint slides, present it back to the management. The management takes it and dictates it stops down. So it's a traditional push model, top down, um, implied on the people. And then they wonder why people at the grassroots are not buying into the change because they don't feel being part of the change. So what we decided um, very early on in that change to be done at Emirates is that I wanted to use primarily my own people. You know, at that time we were about a thousand people in IT, already a pretty sizable organization. And I knew that I had very good people. There was a lot of knowledge experience within my own organization, my own people, and I wanted to make the people part of the change. So what I decided to do is not to work with any of the large consulting companies. I worked together with a very small boutique company out of Munich who came with basically three consultants. Their task was not to contribute to the content of what needs to be done, but which is facilitating the process. The approach we took then is that we picked 20 of our best people from the IT organization um, across all the ranks and levels, but nobody from sort of the, mean, the, the, the middle management layer, because these are typically people who can, um, who can lose the most in change initiatives, in transformations, and um, will probably try to derail the process and block it. So anyhow, we took 20 of our best people out full time, um, gave them these three consultants to facilitate the process, and we gave them the task to redefine how we should work in IT, to start defining what are we here for, what is our mission, what is the vision, what do we want to achieve, what is the strategy, what are the core processes, and only at the very end, out of the processes, we then derived how the organization structure will look like. And it was all driven by our own people. I don't want to go too much into detail how we did that. A lot of focus was put on communication, on keeping people informed, on keeping them involved. And at the, at the end, when the new structure was presented, it was not me or my management team or some external consultants, but it was people from the organization who presented to their colleagues why that new setup would work better and why this is the way we need to work in the future. The other important approach was that we first looked at mission, vision, strategy, processes, and only at the very end we looked at the org structure, because the org structure actually is not really relevant, it's absolutely secondary. You first have to focus on how you work together, what you're working on, what your strategy is, before you discuss how you organize yourself. It's quite uncommon because most change initiatives in companies, they start with the org structure because everyone wants to see their box in an org chart with a name in it. We did it completely the other way around. The other focus we had is because I knew that these change initiatives would create a lot of uncertainty, anxiety within the organization, and you tend to lose a lot of efficiency. So the essence is you have to keep these change initiatives, these uncertainty phases, very short. So we did a time box. We said three months, not more. So the whole project was run within three months. It was time boxed and it was clear. We started at the beginning of September. It was clear by the end of the year it would be done. That doesn't mean that you can do everything at the same time. It's a bit like you know, agile methods work today. You just work time boxed. You achieve what you can achieve within the, the, the given time. And then you might come back in further iterations to sort of detail out what needs to be done. Um, anyhow, um, that project worked really well. The results were pretty amazing because already a month after we implemented the new process in the new structure, you saw improvements happening. We finally had proper processes, operational processes based on ITIL. Uh, we used CMMI framework for software development project management, COVID as a basis for um, governance processes. And um, in the coming years, it was just amazing to see how all the KPIs that we set to improve you know, significantly improved. So this was sort of a bit of learning from my side what I think um, uh, a good change initiative um, was set up. All right, everyone. With this, we come to the end of the change management guest lecture. Uh, just to summarize, you heard me setting a bit of the context around the uh, era that we operate in, the digital era, and uh, in the context, under the context 
uh, in which we need to think about the change. Then I shared some of my learnings in terms of the change mantras. Then my dear uh, colleague, ex-colleague Patrick, very beautifully, very articulately and very clearly uh, shared his journey uh, to a significant change that he led uh, as a leader and his learnings thereof. So, you know, I would now like to summarize, conclude, and as usual, uh, you know, kind of leave you with a, with a thought experiment exercise that you need to do, right? So, you know, think of some of these mantras, right? Either it be, you know, change needs to be time bound, the need to communicate, the need to, uh, you know, have a burning platform, which I think we do with COVID, with COVID now. So think of some of these mantras, either take a case study of a change, professional change that you've been a part of, or take a case of a change that you are going to be uh, crafting in the future. And using these mantras, lay down the top three or four changes uh, or Im uh, implementation of these mantras into a change program that, uh, that you are involved with uh, at whichever level, it re really doesn't matter. Summarize this, you know, present to your colleagues. And I think by doing so, some of the learnings from this get guest lecture would get a bit more embedded into, uh, into yourselves, right? All right, thank you so much for participating. All the very best. Thank you.